we will see how two electrons that usually repel each other can actually come together to form pairs, leading to absolutely zero losses and making this magnet right here levitate. To understand and appreciate what's really going on, we first need to understand how electrons normally behave. Let's take this piece of aluminum right here. If we zoom in, we can reveal its microscopic structure. And what we find is a periodic arrangement of positively charged aluminum ions, with electrons flowing through it. It is this flow of electrons that is what's causing electricity to flow, allowing you to charge your phone. But this flow isn't perfect. Occasionally, the electrons will bump into one of the atoms, transitioning the electron from a higher energy state to a lower one and transferring some of its kinetic energy to the atom, making the atom vibrate a bit harder. These vibrations are what we call heat and it is the source of resistance in metals. Sometimes you can even feel this heat when your charger is getting hot. So how do we get from this messy picture of electrons just bouncing around to a levitating magnet? Well, first we need to cool down, way down, close to absolute zero. We have now cooled down so far that the aluminum atoms hardly vibrate at all. It is at these extremely low temperatures that something interesting happens. As we cool down below the critical temperature of 1.2 Kelvin, the aluminum suddenly transitions from a normal metal to a superconductor. A superconductor is a material that has zero resistance below its critical temperature. A sudden drop, first observed by Kamerling Onnes in 1911. As a result, currents can flow without a single loss, meaning that inside a superconductor, electrons never ever bounce off of atoms. But how can this be? Because the atoms certainly didn't disappear and neither did the electrons. So how can there now be zero collisions? We'll get to it. But first, there is one other effect that classifies a superconductor. And that is that inside a superconductor, there is no magnetic field. Superconductors expel all magnetic fields, forcing the magnetic field to go around the superconductor an effect known as the Meissner effect. So now we know what a superconductor is. It has zero resistance and it expels all magnetic fields. But we still do not know how it works on a microscopic level. 46 years after Onnes first discovered superconductivity, Bardeen, Cooper and Schriever discovered how it worked. What they suggested is the following. As we cool down, the atoms hardly vibrate at all and are mostly stuck in place. As an electron then moves through the atoms, it pulls on them due to their opposite charges. And this pull slightly displaces the ions, pulling a region of them closer together. We now have a small area that's slightly more positively charged than the area surrounding it. Another electron flowing by will be attracted by this positive charge, effectively making the electrons attract each other, allowing them to form pairs, so-called Cooper pairs. And it turns out that forming these pairs is actually energetically favorable. So as we cool down below the critical temperature, the electrons will all pair up. And this is where something interesting happens. Electrons, which are spin one half particles, are fermions, which means that only one electron can occupy one energy state at the same time. But if you take two spin one half particles and you put them together, they will actually start acting as a boson and bosons can all occupy the same energy state. So what we find is that now a new lowest energy state appears, below all the other energy states. And it is this new quantum state that all the pairs fall into. So this explains why it is now impossible for the electrons to scatter. They are already in the lowest energy state. There is no lower energy state for them to transition to. To make things worse, there's even an energy gap between the ground state and the next closest states. Now, we still need to understand why there's no magnetic field inside our superconductor. One simple way of looking at it is the following. As you bring a magnet close to a metal, this will induce eddy currents that oppose the change in magnetic field. In normal metals, these decay rapidly. But in perfect conductors, these currents will keep increasing in strength until they match the external field perfectly cancelling it and never decaying. However, in superconductors, this is not the full picture, because this only works in changing magnetic field. 
but a superconductor will expel any magnetic field, even if it does not change. The London brothers showed that a magnetic field in a superconductor generates supercurrents. And these supercurrents generate their own magnetic field, cancelling the exterior field. Only very close to the surface, part of the magnetic field can actually penetrate since we cannot generate infinite screening currents. But this field decays exponentially. So what ends up happening when we put a magnet above a superconductor is that the magnetic field lines are bent around the superconductor. And this bending of lines generates a force. And when this force is stronger than gravity, we can have a magnet levitate. So magnet levitates because the magnetic field cannot penetrate the superconductor, which results in an upward force. And this is caused by electrons coming together in pairs, so-called Cooper pairs. And here they act as bosons, which allows all of them to occupy the lowest energy state. And then these bosons, these Cooper pairs, start forming screening currents when an external magnetic field is applied. And that is why pairing electrons can levitate a magnet. So, now you know how superconductors work. Or do you? The theory I told you is currently accepted. However, it only works for some superconductors. With this theory, you can reach critical temperatures up to around 30 Kelvin. So imagine the shock of the scientific community when in 1986, a high temperature superconductor at 35 Kelvin was discovered. And just a year later, in 1987, a critical temperature of 93 Kelvin was achieved. Something that seemed clearly impossible from the theory we just learned. So, how is it possible? Well, it seems that there may be other pairing mechanisms. However, right now, 36 years after their discovery, their pairing mechanism is still unknown. The highest critical temperature we have gotten so far is 138 Kelvin. However, it is still minus 135 degrees Celsius or minus 211 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's still very far off that magical goal of room temperature superconductivity, which if discovered would literally transform the world and save billions of dollars on energy. Understanding how electrons pair in these unconventional superconductors could really pave the way for a room temperature superconductor. It would most likely lead to a Nobel Prize as well. Now, just two months ago, at the time of recording, one group from the University of Oxford claimed to have found definitive evidence for what binds these electrons together. They suggest that super exchange interactions closely related to antiferromagnetism are responsible for the pairing. But the jury is still out. So far, it is a 36-year-old unresolved mystery. However, it does seem like we are getting closer. And when we do figure it out, it could really revolutionize the world we live in. Thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoyed. And I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. And if you want to see how you can actually make superconductors, go check out this video by Now Red, where he does precisely that. I will put a link to his video in the description below. See you next time.